The name of the article was Hope Homogenized. Hope Homogenized. There's a saying that uh, you're the cream of the crop, right? There's a, another thing that people will say is that cream always rises to the top. I like that expression. And I like to think that with the favor of God, we're the cream. And, and as long as we stay faithful and true to God, we will rise. But, you know, when you go to the store, if you were to go to the store right now and get a jug of milk and bring it home and open it up, the cream wouldn't rise to the top. And you'd drink that delicious milk, and it would be just a smooth consistency uh, throughout the, the drink because that milk has been homogenized. And the cream in the milk, which uh, would normally and naturally separate, and the cream would rise to the top, that doesn't happen anymore because it's gone through this process called homogenization. And, and I believe that uh, the Lord gave me that as a, an analogy of what will happen to our hope. And with that word hope, I really mean our expectancy. That word talks about our, our expectancy to what God can and will and wants and desires to do. And it's very dangerous if, because God wants us to live with expectation. Amen? Um, and so if that becomes homogenized, it can become dangerous. So what do I mean by that? Um, cream rises to the top of milk because it's lighter than the milk, so it makes sense that it would naturally uh, rise. So what manufacturers will do to uh, get past this obstacle and, and have the, the product that we're used to, this process called homogenization, basically what they do is they take the cream and they'll force the cream through a very small opening. And then they'll force it into uh, that body of, of, of liquid, that milk. And what happens is, is the molecules or the components of cream, as it goes through that tiny, tiny microscopic opening that it's being forced through, it's being pushed through because of pressure that it's being compelled and forced into, it breaks down the component into a, a little bit smaller and smaller and smaller component of cream. And then what happens is the cream that's been broken down to these smaller uh, components, uh, they become, uh, the milk latches on to the cream components and that causes it to be heavier and that starts to weigh down the cream. And because the cream is weighed down, it begins uh, to get blended in with the milk. So it's forced through a small opening and then it's, um, it's, it's broken into smaller pieces, it's weighed down, and it's blended in. I hope that doesn't describe your hope today, reduced, broken, weighed down, blended in, but, but in case it does, amen, God has got, uh, a, I believe, a word to restore and, and, and resuscitate, revive that hope. If you uh, look in the, the book of, of Ruth and the story of Naomi, uh, in Naomi chapter 1, verses 12, and I'm sure you're all pretty familiar with that story. She's gone through this incredible, awful journey. She had to leave the land uh, that she was born in and go into a foreign land. It wasn't a circumstance or situation that she chose. And in life, maybe even right now, you're in a, a, a situation, a circumstance that you didn't choose. You're being forced into something. And so she's forced because of famine to leave her home land and, and, and um, be in the land uh, of the enemies of God, actually. And, and in that land, her husband dies. And her two sons get married, and then her two sons died. And Ruth, uh, or Naomi rather, is forced to leave. She's forced into a tight spot. She's forced into a hard place. She didn't ask for it. You know, if, if she sat down with a, a life coach, a life planner or something, this, this, the way her life unfolded, that probably wouldn't have been her 5-year, 10-year, 15-year plan. Things weren't going the way she planned, the way she wanted. Anyone testify life doesn't always go the way that you plan, that you want, that you expect. It doesn't always meet your expectations. And so Naomi's in this foreign country just as that cream is forced into this, this little tiny uh, area and it's broken. You, we, we find that Ruth is broken because of the circumstances that have happened to her. And, and she goes through this whole situation. And just to fast forward a little bit in her story, in verse 12 it says, Turn again, my daughters, speaking to Ruth and to the other daughter-in-law, 
Go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say, I have hope, you can just feel the sarcasm and the, the, the loss that's brought about this uh, cynical attitude in, in her heart. Uh, and also, she's kind of being realistic at the same time, too, which, which we want to be realistic, quote-unquote realistic as humans, but sometimes God wants us to have expectations greater than what is real, realistic to the, the world of flesh, to the carnal world, to our, our minds of, uh, of reason and logic. Amen? So Ruth, uh, or again, Naomi says, if I have hope, if I should have a husband also tonight and should have sons, would ye tarry for them till they were grown? Would ye stay for them? Uh, and would ye wait for, for them to become your husbands? Nay, my daughters, for it grieveth me much for your sakes that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. And Naomi's to the point in her life where she's comfortable saying, God's hand has gone out against me. There's some pain there. There's some loss there. There's some grief. If you've ever lost someone, you know the, the pain and the grief of losing someone, of saying goodbye. Her son's dying. Those were her dreams. Those were, she lived, she must have lived to, to want to see her sons to grow up and in her old age see them and produce grandkids and they would take care of her in her old age. And it's all gone. The plan is ruined. It, it didn't work out. And you can feel this, this frustration to the point of breaking and I wonder if someone uh, here today has been just forced through hard situation after hard situation after disappointment after letdown and you believed God and maybe you stood up and said, I believe this is going to be the year or I believe we're going to see this or we're going to see that. Brother Hanson, I think this is the year that this happens to our church and you didn't see it happen the way that you thought it was going to happen. And in our spirits, if we don't let God continually come under our wings and lift us up and refresh us that breaking that loss that frustration will so impact us that we can start to pick up subtly on the same attitude that Naomi had this little kind of mm, sarcastic cynical I don't really know I'm, I'm not going to get my expectations up this time I've been let down again and again I've just I mean I'm sorry but I had to leave my country because of famine and then my husband died and then my two sons died you really want me to have hope? You really want me to have faith and you're going to follow me back to my homeland after all this? Look at my story. And Naomi was looking at her story up to that point rather than her God, the author of her story. The, the cream is it's forced in this small uh, microscopic opening. It, because of that, it's broken. And the next thing that happens is it's weighed down. And this is what the enemy would want to do to us, I believe, as Christians, is jump right into this opportunity of disappointment and use it to start weighing us down and pulling us down. And all of a sudden, it's like, let's have reasonable expectations. Like, you know, uh, I know we've been hearing... A bishop preach about this, this unprecedented harvest, but let's just set some goals and see a little bit of growth here or there. And, you know, maybe we'll grow by ones and twos when God wants to multiply us. But when you've seen it not happen, when you haven't seen it, the enemy goes right in there and begins to mess with our mind and mess with our hope. God wants us to be hopeful. It's not a naive, stupid, foolish thing and you should rely on the scientific method and the prediction. No, God wants us to be crazy hopeful, ridiculous hopeful with expectation that doesn't make sense, that's not logical, that breaks the math formula. Naomi's way down. I'm too old to have a husband. Naomi didn't know that God had better plans for her. God had bigger plans. There was a bigger story going on. I think sometimes I lose sight of that. To interject it real quickly, you know, I, I wake up and maybe I'm feeling bad for whatever reason, and I, I immediately reflect on myself, oh, uh, what did I sin? Or, you know, what, what did I do wrong? Or uh, I'm not really in the flow in prayer. I, there must be, you know, God's mad at me, whatever. I don't know why, but my personal 
reaction is always to think there's something wrong with me, I've done something bad. But sometimes there's just things going on in the spirit, I believe. There's seasons. Right now it's cold outside. How many of you wanted it to be cold? I didn't, but God designed the seasons and set them in place, and it's time for it to be cold. And sometimes there's bigger things going on in the spirit. Maybe there are seasonal shifts, and maybe there's just stuff going on. Maybe there's an attack coming against the church of the Almighty God, and you're feeling that attack. Amen. It doesn't mean there's something wrong with you, but it's time to stand up and be a soldier, not be weighed down by how you feel. Amen. God had bigger plans for Naomi. There was something bigger going on than just her little family. He was about to magnify his name through Naomi's life. Blended in is the next thing that happens. That cream just gets so blended in with the milk, you can't even tell the difference. Is there any difference between the level of hope that you live with and the person that you work with in the cubicle next to you? Can, if someone was to walk up to you and look at you and your coworker, you and your brother, you and your whoever, and say, wow, that person's got hope. There's a light burning in that person. There's something shining in that person that is just supernatural. It's of God. Blend it in. And what you can, you can as you read this story and, We won't take time to do it tonight, but if you read all of what Naomi says, you can just feel that bitterness and that disappointment and that resentment towards God. The hand of the Lord has gone out against me. It's funny. She says, I'm sorry for your sake. She's like, you know, she's too spiritual to say, I'm sorry for myself. But she still says, the hand of the Lord has gone out against me, and I'm sorry for your sakes, you know. But all along through this story, if you read it, Ruth is the counterbalance to Naomi. She's the the response, if you will. Ruth is so hopeful. Even this this bitter Naomi couldn't, uh, couldn't dissuade her, couldn't drag her down. And that's the attitude God wants us to have when, when, when maybe it's a person, maybe it's a spirit, maybe it's a whatever. But something like Naomi looks at Ruth and says, no, just give up on hope. Give, no, don't go with me. Don't accompany me to the land of my God. And Ruth is so stubborn that the, the Bible says she was steadfast in her mind. When Naomi saw that Ruth was steadfast in her mind, she stopped trying to persuade her. Another word that could be used uh, in place of that, I guess, uh, of steadfast was is obstinate. Obstinate. I think about a little kid, right? You ever seen a, a little kid that's, that they're just going through that obstinate period where no matter what you tell them to do, they want to do the opposite. Every, you know, maybe you can even uh, use it to your advantage and tell them the opposite of what you want to get them to do what you want them to do because they're just so stubborn right now. They're just so obstinate. Well, maybe sometimes we could take a lesson from the little ones among us and let some stubbornness and some obstinacy rise up in us. No, I believe in God. I believe in what he said. I believe in what he wants to do. I'm not going to let some feeling or some attack pull me down and weigh me down and destroy my hope. Ruth was steadfast in her hope. There's a verse in in the New Testament in Hebrews that says that hope in God and in God's plan and God's goodness and God's salvation, that hope is an anchor for us. If the storm's coming up against you right now, you need an anchor. We stand on the foundation of God's word, on the doctrine, on the truth, all that. But, but you need an anchor of hope in your life uh, that will buoy you, that will, will when, when the winds try to sweep you away, when the storm tries to sweep you away, that anchor will hold you fast and strong and secure. I believe in God. I've got hope in God. But you've got to be willing to, to that in a boat... An anchor in a boat, you've got to be willing to take that anchor and throw it out of the boat so it can go into the water and grab onto something. Maybe that's what God is challenging you to do right now, is to take your hope and express it. Just like you've got to throw that anchor out into the deep, out into the water, and and maybe it'll grab onto something, maybe it won't. I don't know, but I'm going to express my hope, my faith in God, through my worship, through my praise, through my faithfulness, despite the trouble and the storm and the last thing I, I, I felt to mention I had a chance to minister uh, a, 
along these lines in, in Worcester a couple of weeks ago. I didn't include it in the article, but, but if you look at that same verse in Hebrews that talks about hope being an anchor a little bit earlier, he's, uh, the writer of Hebrews is talking about how, um, how the, the promise of God was made to Abraham and how uh, the Lord promised uh, and gave his word to Abraham, the blessing to Abraham. And it goes on to say something along the lines of uh, God couldn't, swear by any greater because if, if man was to swear something you know I absolutely will do this they swear by something greater than themselves God couldn't find anything if you will greater to swear by so he swore by himself because the last thing that really just bugs me about the story of Naomi in this process that we see of her hope being crushed is that she gets back to uh, her homeland and, and roots there with her and she says don't call me Naomi which means pleasant, but call me Mara, which means bitter, for the Lord has dealt bitterly with me. There was something, and it just breaks my heart, but I wonder if it's true about any of us here today. There was something about this, this brokenness and this disappointment and the letdown and the loss and the hurt and the grief that when Naomi looked in the mirror, she didn't see Naomi. She saw bitterness, and she saw loss, and she saw pain, and she saw disappointment, and she saw failure and rejection, and her story defined her. Not the name that she'd been given, not the will of God, not the promises of God, not I'm, a ch I'm one of the chosen people in all the earth. I'm one of God's people. I'm one of the Israelites of God's chosen people. She saw her pain looking back at her. And maybe you go home and you look in the mirror and you don't see yourself as God's chosen vessel that he loved, that he died for, so that you could feel him, so that you could be, have your sins washed away, so that you could know his name. Maybe you look and you see that thing that was done to you, that person that left you, that time you stepped out in faith and you fell flat on your face that time that you were hurt, that you were rejected, that you were lied about, that you were mistreated, that you were made fun of, and it looks back at you, and it defines you, and you say, call me Mara, for I'm bitter. One thing I love is if you read through the rest of the, the book of Ruth, no one ever calls her that. We have a role that we can play in other people's lives that we don't have to endorse their pain and their hurt. We can help remind each other who we are in God. And also, God said this thing, I swear by myself that Abraham, you will be blessed and Without getting into all of it, you all know we can participate in that blessing of Abraham. We are God's children. And so Naomi was in pain and frustration and hurt and all this stuff because of her identity was defined by her story. There's nothing greater than your identity except one thing, God's identity. And God said, I can't find anything greater than myself, so I'll swear by myself, Abraham, I will bless you, and I cannot lie, my word is true. God's word is true to you today. What God said about you is still true. God is faithful. It doesn't matter who you are or what's happened to you or how you might be defined by the junk and the mess and the frustration and loss and disappointment. God is greater than all that mess. And if he's given you a word, if he said something to you, then hold on to it like an anchor. And let God restore your hope. Hallelujah.